We're here today with Charles Brown. It is March 24th, 2003. We're at the Peabody Public Library. My name is Janet Skank. Charles was born uh, September 24th, 1919 in Pensacola, Florida, current, currently living at 309 Shinneman Drive, Columbia City, Indiana, 46725. Thank you, Charles, for participating in this. Um, some questions. Um, were you drafted or were you or did you enlist? I was called active duty since I was in the ROTC at Texas A&M. Is that where you were going to college? Yes. Did you get to finish college there? I did. Okay. And we, what was your degree? Uh, BS in EE and BS in ME. I don't, not, I don't understand what those are. What's EE and ME? EE, Electrical Engineering, okay. ME and Mechanical Engineering. Mechanical Engineering. Okay. Um, and you were going to college, you said, in Texas. Well, college what, Station, Texas. Texas A&M. Um, Texas A&M. Were you, that's where you're going to college. Did, were you actually living there? Was that your hometown? Hometown at that time, at the time of graduation, was Beaumont, Texas. Beaumont, Texas. Okay. Do you recall your um, first days in the service? Yeah, very well. Now, ROT, you got some training in ROT itself. We were in, in uniform. Okay. At that time, Texas A&M was male. Now it's co-ed, uh, so we were, most of us, like 95% of us were in uniform all of the time. And then your first days of service after you finished college and actually, now when you're in ROTC you're not actually in the service then, are you? No. No? No. Okay. So what were your first days as, as a, uh, a uh, soldier? Um, I was second lieutenant, <clears throat> my little gold bars, um, and I reported to Camp Claiborne, Louisiana, and on the way there, <clears throat> yeah, my folks took me from Beaumont by car. On the way there, I realized I did not have a tie, so I'm, it was a Sunday, and I was desperate to get a tie necktie. So I went to the PX and uh, sure enough they were closed. Um, so I did report to um, uh, some headquarters and uh, there at Camp Quaker. And they told me uh, to just go out and join uh, Lieutenant so-and-so uh, had some men doing a little field practice, climbing telephone poles and such. So I found him and I reported and uh, you just didn't do a lot of saluting out in the field. Um, but I, I put on the, the spikes and climbed the pole probably maybe five or ten feet. <laughs> uh, either the next day or very shortly thereafter, I'm uh, taking the uh, report at the morning uh, lineup, <clears throat> and um, I'm saying, Teleo, hit, hit, and uh, that, that's what the, you said, Texas A&M, Um So that was, everybody knew I was brand spanking new. <laughs> but they, they, they let me go. They, yeah, since, <laughs> since you were in ROTC, did you have to do things like, and, and an officer when you finished college, did you have to do things like boot camp or anything like that? What kind of training was there? Uh, just military. Um, normal, um, uh, close order drill. Uh, we, uh, since I was in the Signal Corps at A&M, we had um, jobs to do. Uh, there was emphasis on wire, <coughs> wire communication, 
and radio communication. Uh, so we would have our set up our little command post, and we, and uh, this was a weekly thing. <clears throat> when you finished college and um, went into the army, had the, had World War II started yet? No, had not started <clears throat> yet. Okay. Um, after can I tell you when when it started? Sure. <laughs> Well, after Louisiana, I went to New Jersey, New Jersey to Signal Corps School three months. <clears throat> Got assigned, asked for an assignment to California, and sure enough, got assignment to California. And some of the people smarter than I was said that that's just a jumping off place. Well, I, that was the reason I had asked for California. <laughs> so. Went out to California, <clears throat> drove out with a friend of mine from Signal Corps School, the two of us. Reported to Colonel, and we were one or two days late making that transcontinental trip in my old car and stopping along the way. Um, and the, the Colonel, he didn't press us about why we were late. <clears throat> Just a nice guy, like so many of them. Uh, he said, uh, "There's radio intelligence company shipping out. Uh, they're out in that cabbage patch. <clears throat> uh, the aroma's not too great, <clears throat> but um, go join them." And we were we were practically on our way. Um, we uh, shortly after that. Went to Presidio, San Francisco, and went through the paperwork and the shots and so on. And we left under the um, passed under the Golden Gate Bridge um, on December 6, 1941. Um, and on December 7. We're out, I don't know, maybe a few hundred miles. Had a, we had sealed orders uh, going to Hawaii. <clears throat> uh, and um, the next day, I happened to be standing out on the front part of the ship, <laughs> not the Navy. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I notice that the wake of the ship does 180. Now I wasn't really surprised at that because and just uh, two or three hours before that we got word on the radio that Pearl, Pearl Harbor had been bombed. <clears throat> that was bad news. Uh, <clears throat> And we were in a convoy of two ships. Uh, our ship was nice and white. Um, uh, I don't know how many troops on board. It wasn't just our company. Um, uh, so uh, the officers were issued sidearms, and fortunately, we didn't have to shoot anybody. Uh, <clears throat> but. Um, we didn't know about Japanese submarines, how many are where, or we, if, and we headed home, and we got home faster than we got out there. We just went about as fast as that little old ship could go, <clears throat> and uh, we ended up in Golden Gate Park, and we're in the park for just a few nights. Um, one, one of the fellows in our company had, um, he had a spasm, um, I forget the term, but very common, it's, it's, it's not uncommon, and it's a word that I should not forget. Um, uh, one person goes in, into all kinds of 
contortions. A seizure? It was a seizure. Um, but I think there's a, a name for the physical problem. But anyway, um, that, that was my first experience like that. But um, uh, that was that, that was when the war started. All right. Uh, so I had gotten out of college uh, along with everybody else in the chem warfare, chemical warfare, and signal. Uh, signal Corps. We, we had a special graduation to get heart back just a few months. Uh, special graduation one week early. So there were about a hundred of us who got had a that, that special graduation. The rest of the seniors uh, had their regular graduation time about a month later. So um, uh, back to war, wartime. Uh, we, I was assigned a platoon. Uh, that was about 40 people. And we uh, loaded up in trucks and headed south from San Francisco to uh, Rialto, to Pasadena, um, and so here I am, I got orders to, to move, so I got this piece of paper, I got um, about four or five trucks and a command car, and uh, about 45 men, and we just come right on in to Pasadena and report to commander. And uh, he said, uh, why didn't you call? Well, I didn't know I had to call. <clears throat> so uh, he, was <laughs> he was nice enough about it. But uh, <clears throat> so I have to learn sometime. So uh, uh, we were directed to go to Rialto, California, which was close, <clears throat> little town. And maybe about the size of Columbus City. <clears throat> but um, we, we checked in, uh, we had quarters kind of downtown in a, um, some organization's headquarters. We hadn't been there three hours. Before <clears throat> orange growers in the territory were bringing in uh, bushel baskets of oranges and and uh, inviting uh, the soldiers to uh, their homes for a bath and dinner, it was it was very nice, <clears throat> real nice. Um, that lasted until they could make all of the plans for the next move. <clears throat> uh, I, I had a friend from Beaumont, Texas, who lived in the LA area, uh, and uh, he had a sister. I knew her also, uh, and uh, so. Uh, when we back, went back to San Francisco, we, were, we, we had this assignment for just for a while, then we, for a matter of just a few months. Went back to San Francisco, and now we're preparing. I, I am confused. I'm, I, I didn't want to miss this part, part of it. Uh, uh, this, this friend of mine was in L.A. Um, and um, we're at some time in this procedure, we're in Pasadena, California, about a block from the Rose Bowl, <clears throat> Colorado Boulevard. 
next door to a bowling alley. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we, uh, the fellows and I, uh, would spend some time over there at the bowling alley, of course. And one time I asked the young woman at the desk, how do you do this? And she came and showed me <clears throat> how to bowl. And I bowled 206 twice in a row uh, and proceeded to in, invite her to go <laughs> on a Sunday trip. Uh, and as I recall, we went with her, her folks. But anyway, um, uh, that, that uh, was a, a nice little in, <clears throat> time in, in my service. Uh, uh, then we got orders to then we got orders to return to San Francisco, <clears throat> Presidio of San Francisco, and uh, so. This is wartime, and I uh, want to do things right. So I tell the, the sergeant, I said, now I'm going, uh, I think I probably told him, I was going to see my friend and buy his car, automobile. So I said, now, uh, if you get orders <clears throat> to move out during the night, do it. Well, I, uh, I got in a second-hand car, very foolishly, and uh, sure enough, when I got back to the Elks Lodge <clears throat> in Pasadena, uh, and sure enough, the men and troops, the, the men and trucks are gone. So I checked the quarters and and. Uh, set my alarm, well, I take my alarm clock. Uh, and it's, it's about one or two o'clock in the morning, and uh, I get sleepy driving. So I pull over to the side of the road, set the alarm clock, and for an hour's rest, uh, sleep, <clears throat> woke up, and I, then I'm beginning to realize that it would be a lot better if I'm in the convoy when we arrive at the Presidio of San Francisco because my major would kind of like to know where I am and why I'm not with him. So I'm getting a little concerned. <clears throat> Just about sunrise I see the convoy. So all's well. So we arrive in San Francisco and we do not have a police <coughs> convoy or whatever you call it, police escort. Hmm? escort. A police escort. We didn't have a police escort. Um, so I, I do want to stay with them, so I get in the middle. So I've got a couple of trucks, big two and a half ton army trucks ahead of me and behind me. Two ahead, two behind or so. And we're going up and down those San Francisco hills and just going right through the red lights and I'm just hoping that, that once the one in front of me doesn't stop because the one in back of me is going to foreshorten my automobile. <clears throat> um, but as luck would have it, good luck. We go right on into to, uh, Presidio, Presidio San Francisco and uh, all was, all was well, you might say. And do, uh, very shortly after that, we got orders to go to Fort Lewis, staging area uh, in Seattle. We're going to ship out. Uh, and that would have been um, about the end of August in 1941. Yeah. Um, so, had a real nice trip in the passage. <clears throat> a lot of people have made that trip in recent months and years. Um, 
So uh, we uh, take. I, I'm worried about the captain of the ship because I'm <clears throat> uh, I'm looking up ahead, and there's an island, and there's the mainland, and um, I think, well, this is pretty tricky maneuvering through all these islands. But sure enough, he he no problem. We just kept going. Uh, uh, we arrived, went up the, the um, waterway right up to Anchorage, and uh, that's where we were going to disembark. We got there, and uh, we noticed that the, the, um, <clears throat> the dock was quite high, like maybe 12 feet high or something like that. that <clears throat> and uh, the next morning when we woke up, the, the dock was down there where it should have been. Uh, it's pretty good, <clears throat> pretty good uh, tide right there at Anchorage. And uh, so we, uh, the next morning, <clears throat> We noticed there was a little snow on the mountains, and then the next morning there was snow further down the mountain. So they, uh, we didn't have excessive amount of snow. We had an excessive amount of low temperature. Um, what uh, what we were all about. <clears throat> Signal Radio Intelligence Company. <clears throat> uh, our mission was to copy the Japanese code. <clears throat> now, the Japanese code, kana code, uh, our Morse code generally is about five, <clears throat> up to five elements. Da 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 da, <clears throat> whatever. Uh, so our fellows knew that code. And they had to learn the kana code, kana code <clears throat> and did. So, our men uh, are copying this, and we have a direct line, teletype line, uh, to Washington. And I, I don't know how long it took, <clears throat> um, but the people in Washington were sharp enough to break the code. And, um, we were told that that had some impact. And I don't know whether the war was shortened or anything. probably not. But uh, it's uh, the more you know, uh, you know, the better off you are. But I, I could mention one thing. I, just uh, in in planning an hour or two ago for this meeting, I'm looking at my little diary. Um, and uh, temperatures. I had min, max, and average. Um, with the engineering background, where these numbers just uh, very interesting to me, uh, especially when it's temperature, especially when I get cold if it's under 70 degrees. Um, so I recorded um, time after time, maybe. Uh, 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 five degrees plus Fahrenheit, and maybe minus fifteen, uh, average minus ten. Um, one one night um, is one day. Uh, as part of our training, well, we're in army barracks. <clears throat> And uh, sometimes uh, we lo would lose power, heat, uh, but generally, no, no big deal. <clears throat> but uh, so we took turns, half of us one night, <clears throat> going out, sleeping outside with our, ba uh, with our sleeping bags. We had, each of us had two sleeping bags. Um, you slept with your head out 
out of the inner bag and in, inside the outer bag. So you have this little hole up here for air. But you need insulation. Um, so uh, we just put our sleeping bags down on snow and um, somebody had a, a thermometer stuck in the snow and that night it was 36 below. Now that is highly unusual, but that was just the luck of the draw. Um, we thought we were fine, but sure enough, there was enough heat loss, <clears throat> uh, even from skinny bodies, <clears throat> to melt some snow, and then you had ice, and then you're it kind of cold. Um, but the next morning, uh, I was going to roll up my sleeping bag nice and neat. My hands were about to freeze. I just put everything under my arm and ran, literally. Uh, it was only a hundred yards to the dorm, dorm to the <clears throat> barracks. But uh, thank goodness that was all. <clears throat> Um, did you spend most of your time in Alaska then? Quite a bit of time. Uh, from that date of arrival, uh, late August, uh, until the time I got out of the service, which was about March of 40, 46. <clears throat> so most of it. Got married up there. Did you? Met my wife up there, blind date, three women, three men, and um, uh, one of the one of the fellows was well, one of the lieutenants had a, a friend. Uh, I guess he got there before we did. I don't know. Didn't know. I don't know. Remember how long they they. He know knew her, but anyway, uh, he he set this up for the uh, other two of us and two other girls, and uh, so here are the, the six of us on a street corner at the post. <clears throat> We're going to go to a movie, and uh, the other <laughs> the other fellows, a uh, uh, nervous type, and and yeah, he. Uh, pairs off with one of the girls, and one of the two. Uh, so that was fine by me, because I had already made up my mind. And so, uh, about oh, 15 months later, we got married. And uh, we... <clears throat> Couldn't, you couldn't uh, find an apartment. Well, we found an apartment that was in process of being built. <clears throat> so, uh, we rented the apartment for, we had to pay for six months in advance. And uh, we uh, went on our honeymoon uh, up to Mount McKinley, Alaska. And then um, <clears throat> we went. We had an excuse for going on up to Fairbanks. Yeah, the, the railroad uh, had a washout or some problem, <clears throat> so that was okay. Uh, so we get back to Anchorage, to our our home, and basement apartment, one window. Um, the door is not on the apartment. <clears throat> the Stove, the range, is not connected. There are bugs in the drapes to the window. The owner, landlord, he and his dog have been sleeping in our bed. And he is uh, nowhere around. So I, I go down to <clears throat> visit some of the Dens, um, some bars, a lot of bars, 
uh, and I find him, and uh, he comes out. My wife was fit to be tied, but of course, <clears throat> but he got got the door on, got the stove connected up, um, and we uh, we stayed there. <clears throat> in that basement apartment for a while and then uh, uh, later, a few months later, um, we had a chance to go up upstairs to uh, vacated the apartment. Uh, so that was a little better, a lot better. So uh, and by this time we've had the baby. Uh, and thanks to the uh, signal corps, I had the only telephone. We had the only telephone in the apartment house. There were ten apartments. <clears throat> uh, and uh, one one morning, about one o'clock, somebody knocked on the door. Uh, wife and I both hit the deck. Uh, uh, to see whether or not somebody in the apartment had an emergency and needed the telephone or something. <clears throat> it was a, there's no excuse for my getting all choked up at, uh, on this story, but I do that occasionally. Um, um, there's a short um, Eskimo uh, in uh, Alaskan. <clears throat> and a tall GI in uniform. Uh, they wanted to know whether Lucy was there. And, and I said, Lucy who? Um, well, they didn't know about the who part. <clears throat> and uh, uh, living across the, street, uh, across the uh, hall from us uh, was a tall, good-looking girl. Um, and I, I think I had maybe had some suspicions before that, but uh, uh, the next day, or actually the same day, uh, I, I found the owner and I told him uh, <clears throat> uh, to back up just, just a short time. Um, there was only one um, bathroom on our floor for our four, four apartments. And uh, I was the only one who was taking care of the bathroom. <clears throat> um, so uh, there are various reasons that uh, I, I was out to seek some change. <clears throat> um, so I, I to told him uh, uh, what happened and uh, wh why I was suspicious, suspicious. and um, he said oh, no, nothing could be uh, wrong. He said he, he knew her father. Well now, you know, it just kind of escaped me what that proved. <laughs> so, um, I, we put an ad in the paper. You couldn't get an apartment. I put, I put an ad in the paper, Texan needs apartment because <clears throat> people have been putting ads in the paper that <clears throat> will drown children, uh, all kinds of things. Within 24 hours, we had not an apartment. We had a house, <clears throat> um, and uh, so uh, very shortly, and this was just shortly before Christmas time that year, we moved. So, I had on my fatigues, my <clears throat> coveralls, and the garrison cap, and my insignia, and, and uh, it's nine o'clock at night, and we're through moving, so I go next door, <clears throat> and uh, knock on the door, and uh, footsteps, and footsteps, and footsteps, and, <clears throat> um, there's a little window in the door, and a little, uh, and uh, uh, some woman opens the door, and I said, 
my name is, uh, I probably said Charlie Brown, or <clears throat> maybe not in those days, but uh, <clears throat> I said, we just moved in. I wondered if I could borrow your newspaper. Somebody else comes to the door with a newspaper, and uh, that's the last I ever saw of anybody. Uh, there was some traffic, you know, car traffic to that particular house. But there we were, next door. We, we asked the uh, landlady, a nice person. Her husband was a Texan. <clears throat> and um, uh, she must have had a good marriage. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, asked, uh, I asked her, <coughs> or I told her. And she said, well, she kind of wondered. Um, you know, she kind of wondered, yeah. We all wondered. Um, you, some of the interviews that we've done, people talked about the shortages during the war, different food shortages. Since you were in the Army itself, did you experience those kind of shortages? We had overages. We had overages. Uh, I haven't heard that term used before, so that's a new one. But um, uh, people in the States couldn't get pineapple. We had pineapple three times a day. Some people got tired of it. A lot of people got tired of it. Um, no, we, we uh, ate well. Not as well as I'm eating nowadays. <laughs> How about doing things for fun? What kind of things did you do for fun? Um, we had Olivia de Havilland come. You, remember, you know that I name? I know Olivia de Havilland, yes. Uh, did you watch uh, uh, the uh, awards last night? No. Yeah. Well, I think Olivia de Havilland was somebody who was <clears throat> on the program. Yeah. I'm fairly sure of that. But what a difference. She was uh, there in person? Uh, oh, she was there in person. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> um, and there were a lot of the old timers there. And it was it, it was long, drawn out, but it was really good. But uh, uh, so uh, we'd have the USO come. Uh, but of course, that you know that might be once every year or two. Um, uh, basketball. We had our our co company had a basketball team, and they won the, the post and had to go to um, <clears throat> all of the troops. There was uh, Fort Richardson and Elmendorf Field. They were all together. <clears throat> now I think they're two separate things. But uh, we, had a, we had a little guy on our, team, uh, on our company team Rat Barlatani was his name. He was from um, New York City. And if <clears throat> if there was a woman in the audience, he put on a show, and he was good. <laughs> it was <laughs> so 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 interesting. Uh, well, we uh, sometimes uh, go skiing. Uh, I decided to show off my skiing ability because I had skied once before in, in California when we were stationed in Pasadena. Um, uh, so I decided to show off. <clears throat> so we're, uh, <clears throat> we're going this two and a half ton truck, a uh, bunch of us, and it's slow. Um, some new new snow, maybe so so much, <clears throat> so high, so deep, uh, and um, um, starting out kind of a little slow, and I, I can't. My skis go this way, and I, I go this way, head in the snow. <laughs> oh well, it's you know it's part of. <laughs> How do you keep in touch with your family in in the United back home? Uh, just by letters occasionally. Did you get to go 
on leave often? Oh, or? no. No? Oh, no. Um, my wife, well, that was before we got married, she got to go home. She was a civilian employee oh, I see. of the engineers. <clears throat> And she got to go home. So she got, she got to go home. <clears throat> Do you remember where you were when you found out the war ended? No. I. <laughs> there were so many things that I just don't remember. Okay. Uh, uh, and um, I think I've always been that way. Of course, it's getting a little worse now. At um, we'll 83 or so, I got an excuse. Right. <laughs> At my age, you have an excuse too. So no, no, no. <laughs> um, after the war, then, what did you do? After the war, mm -hmm. uh, we you stay in Alaska. We you didn't stay in Alaska. We did, most definitely, assuredly, did not. We went south. Um, we got on a ship. <clears throat> well, first we got on a train at about 7.30 in the morning. And uh, who shows up on the train? Well, it's still in the station, but the landlord. That landlord. And he said, and he was a rough, tough guy. He'd get into fights and he'd... Uh, He'd win most of them. Yeah, gambler. He'd had a police record back in the states. Uh, so he, uh, he said that I owed, we owed him some money, um, and uh, in one way we did. But uh, we rationalized and figured that he owed us a lot more than we owed him. So he said uh, we won this twenty-eight dollars. And I said, uh, I don't have it. Well, I had it, but I wasn't about to give it to him. So, uh, he said, well, we'd never get on that ship. Uh, so, we went down to Whittier or Seward, wherever the, <clears throat> the troop ship was. Um, and up the gangplank, got on, away we went. So, where's stopped the catch can on the way down. We're walking around with a, a babe in a pink pram suit. <clears throat> uh, a babe about um, oh, less than a year old. Uh, and uh, some civilian <clears throat> came up to us and he said, are you Charles Brown? Uh, I said, no, uh, my name is Robert Roberts, and uh, he didn't look convinced. So he went to the ship, to talk to the captain or somebody, and he found out that I was walking around with a babe in a pink pram suit. He came, well, we go back to the ship, we got to get on the ship because we're headed for Seattle. At least we thought we were, well, we were. So. Uh, he comes up to me and he says, I'm Deputy U.S. Marshal Jones. And he said, uh, I understand you are Charles Brown. I said, that's right. He was mad and I was mad. Uh, I was mad because he was vegan. <laughs> so so uh, he uh, reads this document that says, you will report forthwith to Anchorage to appear as a witness in a trial uh, brought by some branch of the federal government <clears throat> against our landlord because he uh, didn't obey all the laws of the OPA or whatever law was on the books at the time. So uh, he proceeded and we proceeded back to the ship and we went to our room and we shut the door and we waited to hear that noise. And sure enough, 
So we proceed. We go to uh, I think Juno was after the Juno stop was after that. Then we get to Seattle, and uh, <clears throat> we're walking down gangplank, and here's a major. Um, I would have been nice to him regardless. <clears throat> um, he outranked me among other, among other things, um, but he uh, looked up and he said, uh, Are "You Charles Brown." Yeah. So he said, um, you're going to have to go back to Anchorage. He said, um, he knew all about me. He knew that I was married. He knew we had a baby. He knew where my wife, uh, who my wife was and where she worked and where she, uh, her folks, her mother lived. He said, you can uh, take her home or you can put her in a hotel here in Seattle, or you can take her back. I said, I'll take her home. <clears throat> and uh, he loaned me his car, and uh, we went to his house, and his, his wife helped my wife change the baby. <laughs> it was great. Oh, okay. So then, then we, we find we have this horrible trip, uh, all, these, all this traffic, um, and all these lights, and the headache. We get to this special uh, place where a lot of the uh, dependents are living, <clears throat> a lot of apartments, and we're knocking on doors at 2 o'clock in the morning. People are so nice to us, they should have shot us. We finally find her mother. So I meet, I meet the mother, and uh, then I go, then I go back <clears throat> to Anchorage. I'm the only passenger in a C-54, only passenger sitting up there in the <clears throat> uh, in the co-pilot seat. Uh, we um, we I'm. <clears throat> I serve as a witness and uh, in, in due time get on another plane and head back. And on the way back, back down, <clears throat> uh, we're going past the head of the glacier. And the, the, the pilot, he just does a, a 360 and we go close to the head of the glacier and he feathers the prop <clears throat> and a piece of ice Piece of ice, yeah. That's a piece of the world. Uh, so maybe this piece of ice, uh, glacier in the making, uh, is maybe about three feet wide, maybe uh, 30, 40 feet long, something like that. And just, I have a window seat, and I'm looking right down on it. <laughs> Gee whiz. Uh, it just slithers down into the water. Uh, a, lot, a lot of good things happen. <clears throat> of course, uh, the, the best, the most good thing uh, was getting married up in Alaska and the um, honeymoon too. Uh, uh, back after, <clears throat> after honeymoon, just back in time now. Uh, uh, I'm uh, on duty at the headquarters, Alaskan Defense Command, Fort Richardson. So I, I have three shifts. I, so I'm, uh, one time when I'm on the graveyard shift, graveyard swing, swing shift, <clears throat> um, something like 4 p.m. to midnight. <clears throat> I'm going home to my apartment, my wife, I'm going down the main street <clears throat> of Anchorage and not too long, a few years after that, the <clears throat> there was a, something else went down Main Street, the, <clears throat> the earth opening up, uh, we call that a earthquake. earthquake, we had an earthquake, right? Anyway, I'm going down the street and I happened to glance to the right. And there, 
There, um, uh, there I see Mount McKinley. It's about 125 miles away, and it looks so majestic. Midnight. Mm. That's Alaska for you. Oh, so, so. sounds beautiful. <sighs> sounds beautiful. Charles, you've had some. You've given us some uh, very important information. Shared some very special stories with us. Is there anything else that you'd like to share? Oh. Um, we uh, we go to Fort Sam Houston in in uh, San Antonio, so I can get out of the service. Um, uh, in, in the meantime, I've met my wife's relatives. Uh, wonderful. So <laughs> then we drive. Uh, <clears throat> by this time, I've got the car. I did forget to mention when we came down on the ship. <clears throat> The, sh uh, the next trip of that ship, it grounded, broke in two. It took four days to get the people off the two pieces of that ship, and they lost all of the cars on board. My car was on the, on the ship with us. So this second-hand car that I bought up in Alaska, we start out in that. And there's a great, um, great big sign, stop, put on your chains. Um, <clears throat> there is shortly after we're leaving Portland, mm -hmm. Oregon. So we didn't have chains, and we had a, a babe, and we had we were expecting by that time too. Um, so we just kept going. Well, thank goodness we didn't have to stop because if we didn't stop, we would not be able to get started. But anyway, well, we made that trip. We had we had seven flats and a blowout. Now and. We would, we would have a flat, and uh, out in the country someplace, and we'd be in front of a, <laughs> we'd be in front of a gas station. Uh, we got, we got to, um, finally, we got to uh, a small town in Texas, and uh, we we were in bad shape tire-wise, obviously, and the guy there. Uh, I don't know whether you had a fellow in a service man in the family or what, but anyway, you couldn't buy tires. Well, he gave us two new tires. Well, he sold us two new tires. But anyway, uh, then my wife met my family. That was nice. Uh, then we, uh, we start out for Indiana. Um, I, I, when I graduated, I had a job with GE, but I couldn't, <clears throat> I couldn't take it because the Army called. So <clears throat> I still had the job. <clears throat> so I come to Fort Wayne, and uh, uh, there's a German prisoner of war camp in Fort Wayne. You may be aware of it. Okay. Um, they sent the German prisoners of war home, as you know, and uh, they made this, uh, these places available for returning GIs who didn't have a home. Black tar paper shack, no inside walls. Most of, the, most of them didn't have any running water. We were lucky again, had uh, running cold water. Um, uh, I think we had a little hot plate or something. For, <clears throat> um, uh, so we were we were there for a, a little while. I I wanted to get something different. And now uh, I want to move out of that place. And uh, I, I look at the ads. I, I, I went to a funeral home uh, to see if I could find out who died and whether or not the the home might be <laughs> available. Um, but uh, we were there for a few months. Mm. But that was that was Fort Wayne, which was so different from Fort Wayne now. Oh my! Mm. <laughs> well, Charles, it's about time to stop. We uh, appreciate you coming in and sharing your your stories. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
I'm glad I didn't know that this was going to be running. <laughs>